Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome back to Mad Medicine. In this video, we're going to be discussing panic disorder. Now, if you guys don't already know, we have a YouTube channel and on our YouTube channel, we have a playlist for the psych uh, for USMLA Step 1 video. So go ahead and check that out. And when you do, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe to our channel. And with that being said, let's discuss panic disorders. But before we actually discuss the disorder, panic disorder itself, we need to first talk about panic attacks. Panic attacks are very common. It's something you may be exposed to when it comes to step one, as well as when you're working in the clinical field itself. And this is pretty much what a panic attack looks like. I've already shown you a visual. Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory, he constantly has panic attacks over the smallest things. So pretty much a panic attack is a period of intense, intense fear and discomfort. That's the main key giveaway. Uh, someone who's having a panic attack is going to feel very anxious, they're going to feel very scared, and they're not going to be able to cope for that moment. And usually these attacks are going to peak within 10 minutes or so, and then they go away. They're very short-lived, they're very acute, they don't last for a long time. Now when it comes to diagnosing someone with having a panic attack, uh, there are several symptoms you should be aware of. Now they need to have at least four of the following symptoms, and for your understanding sake, we made it easy. We split up these symptoms based off the first letter of their word, and uh, we've created a very good mnemonic or, uh, for you guys to memorize. So the first letter is going to be the word P. Okay, P stands for palpations, paresthesia, or depersonalization. They may feel you know, heart palpations. They may see themselves in a third-person point of view uh, when they're going through a panic attack. The next letter is going to be A, which stands for abdominal distress. A lot of patients say that, you know, my stomach hurts, I don't feel good. And along with abdominal distress, they also end up having nausea. I want to go back to A for a second. I forgot that abdominal distress and anxiety. We forgot to include anxiety, but they, a lot of patients also end up having anxiety when they're going through panic attack. So back to letter N, that stands for nausea. A lot of patients along with abdominal distress may feel nauseous, like they want to throw up. And that's why, you know, uh, they may say, hey, I need to go to the bathroom or something like that. Next letter is I, which stands for an intense fear, which makes sense, right? We talked about that in uh, a little while ago, that panic attack is a period of intense fear. And that's what these patients are going through, intense fear, which can lead to feeling lightheaded, which can lead to feeling scared and having, you know, heart palpitations, etc., etc. Uh, the next letter is C, which stands for chest pain, chills, and choking. They may not be able to, you know, swallow. They may feel like their heart is hurting along with abdominal distress. And finally, the last letter is S, right, which stands for sweating, shaking, or dyspnea, or shortness of breath. And together, all of these create the mnemonic uh, panics. That should help you understand the symptoms of having a panic attack. Now, one thing I want to say is a lot of times people uh, end up misdiagnosing or misunderstanding a panic attack for a chest, uh, sorry, for a heart attack. And it's very simple, right? Because a lot of the symptoms are very similar to a heart attack. These patients feel chest pain. They have uh, they have shortness of breath. They feel sweats. They're nauseous. Uh, they also have abdominal discomfort along with palpations, et cetera, et cetera. But the main thing that should give it away that it's not a heart attack is going to be one, the intensity of fear. That's a main key giveaway. These patients have uh, irrational or rational sense of fear that's happening. They may feel, uh, um, uh, sorry, along with that, they might have some nausea. That's the first thing, the fear. And the second thing that gives it away is that it's very acute. It only lasts for 10 seconds, uh, 10 minutes, and then it goes away. So those two things combined should gear you towards a panic attack. Now, a lot of times these panic attacks have a, a, a causality that's causing this. And usually it's triggered by a very stressful situation, which could be an exam at school, it could be a deadline at work, anything like that. That can lead to a panic attack, especially if they're stressed out, especially if they're scared of the outcome. Uh, patients will become more susceptible to having a panic attack. Now that we know what a panic attack is, let's go ahead and let's talk about uh, the actual topic of today's video, which is panic disorder. Panic disorder is when someone has recurrent unexpected panic attacks due to an unknown trigger. That's the main thing. There has to be an unknown trigger that's causing uh, the disorder itself, right? A panic attack by itself is usually known. We know it's arised by a stressful situation and usually during a panic attack you can deduce what the situation is. Now when it comes to panic, panic disorder, you will see patients having panic attacks based off of simply the symptoms, uh, but we don't know what the trigger is.
Now this needs to happen at least four times. Uh, they need to have at least four of the panic symptoms. And the symptoms are, you know, the systemic manifestation of the fear itself that's been happening for them. So in order to diagnose someone with panic disorders, they need to, uh, the, the panic attack must be followed by one or more of the following for greater than or equal to one month, right? That's the key distinction. Remember we talked about in psych, a diagnose, diagnostic criteria are really important, especially for step one, where you need to know that uh, one uh, greater than or equal to one month is the giveaway uh, for a panic disorder. These patients must have a persistent concern of additional attacks, right? They may be afraid of this attack coming back maybe in public and that may be very, very embarrassing for them. They may be worried about the consequences of the, of the attack, so maybe they're going to be ostracized. Maybe their work performance might uh, suffer or their school performance might suffer, so they're worried about that. And then they may have behavioral changes due to attack. So this may mean something like they don't want to go outside, they don't want to have a lot of friends, they're very snappy, they're very anxious all the time. So those uh, are the main diagnostic criteria for having a panic disorder along with having panic attacks. Now again, this can be caused by many things, but mainly it's usually due to an unknown trigger. And it's usually uh, it has a very strong genetic component associated with it, which I thought was very interesting. And I'm just going to put a star next to it just so you guys have an understanding. There is a genetic component. Patients whose parents are who have had panic disorder are more likely to develop panic disorders than those who do not have uh, parents with panic disorder. And then finally, stressful situations can cause panic disorder. It can go from panic attacks to panic disorder as a progression of the disease. Now, there is an increased risk of suicide, and that kind of makes sense. It's very intuitive. If someone is suffering from these symptoms of you know heart palpitations, intense fear, they may feel like it's too much to handle, and they may uh, feel like they're you know ready to commit suicide. So that's definitely something you should watch out for when it comes to panic disorder. And the treatment for panic panic disorder is going to be cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, SSRIs, and venlafaxine, which is an SNRI, serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. It works the same way as is SSRI, but it includes norepinephrine. Now, secondly, you can also give benzodiazepines occasionally in an acute setting just to calm them down. But for long-term treatment, you want to focus on cognitive behavioral therapy, SSRIs, or an SNRI. Some sort of medication or medical treatment should be associated with the cognitive behavioral therapy. So with that being said, thank you so much for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you guys don't already know, you can find our lectures on our favorite on any of your favorite podcast services for free. So just go there and type in Mad Medicine and we should pop up. And with that being said, thank you so much for watching and go ahead and continue on to the next video.